dusk in the eastern Mediterranean. The people on the island of Thera have felt something so awful, so frightening, so cataclysmic, they prepare to abandon their island home. They fill storage jars with wine, olives, and wheat, as if one day they will return to reclaim them. They carefully close each lid. But their most precious possessions, their gold and their jewels, they take with them and rush to their boats. What the people feel is the earth itself trembling beneath them. They have survived earthquakes in the past. But this is no mere earthquake. The year is 1628 BC. The people will never return to their olives and their wine. They will simply flee into the night and into the sea, inspiring a mysterious legend that haunts us to this day. Very soon, a massive volcanic eruption will blow their island apart. It will bury all evidence of their lives. Yet memories will remain. Footprints in the dust, waiting to be discovered. Three thousand years ago, the utter disappearance of an island and its people must have left the powers of the region awestruck. The Egyptians had known Thera. Their ships would have traveled north and found where there had been a very mountainous island. They found nothing, just these slivers of broken rib-like land. To the Egyptians, finding this still smoking, booming crater where there was a hole eight, mile wide, eight miles wide in the earth. Uh, they couldn't have imagined that most of this material would have been blown into the sky and caused the beautiful sunsets that they were seeing at that time. To them, an island that had been there had simply sunk and disappeared. In centuries to come, a great legend will develop of a utopian island society that disappeared into the sea. That island is called Atlantis. The Greek philosopher Plato told a story that he claimed came from Egypt. It had been handed down from a relative of an Athenian lawmaker called Solon. Solon met an Egyptian priest who claimed his sacred books contained an amazing story about a large island that had vanished in a single night. These were facts, claimed Solon, not fiction. On the island, a highly advanced civilization had developed. There was an island called Atlantis in which rose a great and marvelous power. The people retained a certain fineness of mind and treated one another with wisdom and forbearance. They were said to have built a magnificent city and lived prosperous, productive lives. But according to legend, they became corrupt. It was then that tragedy struck. There occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single night of misfortune, the island of Atlantis disappeared in the depths of the sea. Did that wonderful world really exist? Could such a civilization disappear so completely? The legend of Atlantis has teased the imagination ever since. As the mystique grew, it was claimed this ancient people possessed computers, spaceships, even nuclear weapons. Atlantis has been found everywhere from the rainforests of Guatemala to the mountains of Tibet and, of course, on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean.
More serious study has pointed to a Greek island known in the ancient world as Thera. A small dot in the Aegean Sea between Egypt, Greece, and Asia, it's now just a rim of volcanic rock jutting out of the sea. But is Thera the lost island of Atlantis? For an answer, we must journey back to the time of gods and heroes. What do their stories reveal about Atlantis? One man, Homer, is the source for many of our myths. But did he describe real people, real places, and real events? To find the answer, we must re-examine the greatest legends of the Aegean world. The tale of a mighty Greek king murdered by his wife and her lover the day he returned home from the Trojan War. The fearsome minotaur, half man, half bull, who stalked his prey in a dark labyrinth on the island of Crete. And Helen of Troy, the face that launched a thousand ships and a ten-year war with the Greeks. Our investigation takes us from Thera, now called Santorini, to Troy in Turkey, to Mycenae in western Greece, and to the island of Crete. But it begins with Homer's dramatic tale of the Trojan War. He tells of Greek armies descending on Troy to win back the beautiful Helen from her Trojan lover, Paris. Men battled to the death while gods squabbled over favorites on either side. For ten years, the Greeks were unable to penetrate the gates of Troy. Ultimately, the battle would be decided not by arms, but by a trick. Pretending to accept defeat and depart, the Greeks left behind an enormous hollow wooden horse. The Trojans dragged the gift into the city, but it was filled with soldiers. For centuries, ancient Turkish legends spoke of a ruin on Turkish soil called Troy. But in the 19th century, nothing along the shore suggested it was the site from Homer's epic war. Still, one man believed those legends. His name was Heinrich Schliemann. He'd been obsessed by Homer's Troy since childhood and was convinced the stories were true. Clutching his well-worn copy of the Iliad, he set out to find the site of the great Trojan War. Heinrich Schliemann decided that he would begin excavations in Troy in the late 1860s and he got permission from the Turkish authorities to begin this work. He didn't really have a clue about archaeology, what excavation was like, but he was following the sources that he read in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey that described the topography of the plain and of the rivers around there. Homer wrote of two rivers flowing near Troy, one with steam rising from it, the other cold as hail. So Schliemann took off his shoes to test the waters. On April the 9th, 1870, he selected a site and set his team to work. Born in Germany, Schliemann made his fortune in America in the California gold rush. In one sense, he was an amateur prone to exaggeration. In another, he was a visionary with an insight few professional archaeologists could match. Anticipation built when the team turned up a coin marked Ilium, the Roman word for Troy. Digging deeper, Schliemann found signs not of one city, but of several, one on top of the other. He kept digging, believing that when they reached Homer's Troy, he would find a great treasure. He plunged right down into the earliest levels, made a lot of mistakes, but he learned as he went along, and he realized that he was truly on the trail of the epics of Homer in the excavations at Troy. When he was lost, Schliemann always returned to Homer. When the Trojans were feasting, Ulysses and his Greeks crept out of the wooden horse. They opened up the city gates and let the Grecian army in. That night, the city of Troy was sacked and burned. So Schliemann searched for traces of fire. 